The moon rises overhead, full and shining bright. I smile as I describe her rumbling in the earth and the black sun rising from the eastern woods to float just above the trees. From the black sun, a hideous cacophony is heard, screaming and screeching and laughter all at once. The noble begins to laugh hysterically as he declares that they will all die, that they ignored the real problem until it was too late. Now, the world is over and them with it. Hey, what's up everybody? Spy Shy Fei here. Welcome to another DD Green Text video. Hope you guys are doing a wonderful day today. Before jumping into it, I want to quickly kind of ask you if you want to take a moment to smash the like button. It takes a second, helps out a lot, and I appreciate it. So thanks so much for that. And yeah, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. The Hell Labyrinth, aka How the PCs Cause an Apocalypse. This is, I believe, my finest hour as a DM. Nothing that I've done before or since was as cool as the way that this ended up and I used the aftermath of this campaign as the basis for many adventures now in the modern day. This is the story of the Black Sun and the Hell Labyrinth. Be me, Dia. Be not me, party of five. Human ranger man, human cleric girl, Elval twins boys and girl, both sorcerers, and a half-orc paladin man. Setup is that there is an evil cult connected with the nine hells called the Society of the Black Sun. They have spread their influence throughout high society across the world. Nobles and bishops alike do blood rituals and sacrifices in exchange for wealth, power, and every vice that the sense desires. Black Sun has been searching for people of legend to kill. Supposedly, five people exist out there that have been foretold to destroy their plans. Party has each been wronged by Black Sun cultists in some personal way due to the Black Sun's fervor in invalidating the prophecy. Ranger had his father sacrificed. Cleric discovered the head of her church had captured children to feed to demons, thinking one of the children was the prophesied ones. Twins were booted out of magical university for speaking out against the rituals, and Paladin got orders from his god to smite this evil, being told explicitly that he was one of those destined to stop this plague on the world. Campaign begins. Parties motivated and ready to strike. They disrupt rituals and kick cultists left and right in the teeth in every village they enter. They crush moonlit gatherings where blood is turned into gold and midnight sacrifices where one can exchange a life for fresh crops or healing of pestilence. They hear a rumor from the cultists they defeat of a large ritual that will take place on the full moon a year from then that will be very important. The cultists claim that they will ascend to godhood, that the world will be changed and they will be exalted. Party is very concerned. Heads to the region where the ritual will be taking place. Upon arrival, they meet an affable but brutally practical noble. He is lawful evil, but doesn't trust the cultists. He has expelled them from his castle and city, but worries they are up to no good in the countryside. He also has concerns of spies within his own walls. Noble has casually had the families of the cultists executed, even those that did no wrong. Says he can't be too careful rooting out this vile menace. Paladin bristles at this and swears to stop him. Noble simply laughs. It's necessary, he says, and chides the paladin for being naive in the face of such chaos. Noble has a beautiful daughter who's pure of heart and doesn't approve of her father's actions. The human ranger is immediately smitten with the girl and spends his every spare moment with her. Noble suggests an alliance to the party in order to find and stop the ritual. Party begrudgingly agrees. Noble works with the party to root out a corrupt cultist crew hiding in his castle cellar the pinnacle of which involves a woman who is tied up and prepped to be turned into a demonic beast. Cultists laugh as they are defeated, saying that she has already been prepared for the spell, so all they must do is kill her with a special dagger that they each have before midsummer and she will transform. Party debates on what to do with her. She lies sobbing on the floor. They can't come to a conclusion and keep arguing on how best to stop the ritual. Noble grows tired of the bickering, casually walks over and swings his sword, cutting off her head. The party is aghast at his horrifying action, but he calmly explains that with her dead the wrong way, this ritual they were attempting is incomplete and the cultists lose. Now, they just need to stop all the others and the problem is solved. The party is riled up and furious. They try to attack the noble, but his guards outnumber them. They take his daughter with them as they retreat, swearing revenge. Many sessions pass. They have now dedicated themselves to destroying this noble. They attack his guard caravans, steal his taxes and distribute them to the poor, and they strike out at his heavy-handed attempts to find them in villages and towns. They hit his guards before running away to hide in another town or village. The people love them and trust them. The noble 
continues to exhort them to focus on the cult via messages delivered by the town crier. One such town crier gets murdered by cultists upon his message being delivered, who exclaims that the sentence is nearly upon the world and that all should bow before the black sun or die. They say that to oppose them is blasphemy. Party grits their teeth and lets this slide for fear of the noble noticing them if they make too much of a ruckus in the town. They slowly slink away into the depths of the town. The party hides from the noble soldiers who engage the chanting cultists in battle. They duck into the seer's hut as blades crash together outside. The seer, seemingly expecting them, proceeds to read their fortunes and tells them that she sees a black sun rising to consume the world. But she sees five points of light that chain the sun down, each chain lying in the hands of the five party members. She also sees the chains fraying, the links splitting and fears what will happen if they break. Party leaves and camps in wilderness outside of town where a group of like-minded villagers have gathered to aid them in their quests. The ranger consummates his love with Noble's daughter, tells her he loves her and promises to marry her. They share a tender moment under the moonlit sky of a nearly full moon. Sorcerer twins dance and play for villagers hiding with them. The sound of laughter and clapping echo into the night. Clary Girl holds a small boy on her lap and is telling him stories. She smiles as the fire flickers across her gentle face. That night, the half-orc paladin has a dream of a black sun rising above the trees to the east. He sees flickering movement inside of it and it fills him with dread. He talks to the party about it and they decide they'll deal with it after they stop the noble. They decide to deal with this quickly and move that day. They proceed to the noble's castle after gathering villager militia. Peasants and guardsmen and angry farmers all gather to their banner to lay siege to the noble's castle. Noble calls them all fools from atop his embankment, says he saw the real picture, what was really important, but they are too short-sighted to stop the real threat to the world. Paladin calls up saying the biggest threat right now is him. Noble sneers at him and says that everyone is going to die now and it's all their fault. Siege begins. Noble has few guards left now, so after archers and mages are taken out from the walls, the peasants breach the gates with a battering ram. Noble is standing in the courtyard with his sword out and asks for a duel if they have any honor left. Paladin obliges and pulls out his sword. The two face each other from the courtyard, glaring daggers at one another. The moon rises overhead, full and shining bright. I smile as I describe a rumbling in the earth and the black sun rising from the eastern woods to float just above the trees. From the black sun, a hideous cacophony is heard, screaming and screeching and laughter all at once. The noble begins to laugh hysterically as he declares that they will all die, that they ignored the real problem until it was too late. Now, the world is over and them with it. Dark figures begin to dart out of the black orb in the sky. First a few, then more. Soon, an other deluge of devils begins pouring out, blackening the skies and blanketing the ground. The world was over. The apocalypse had begun. With enmity forgotten, both the noble and the party rallied the peasants into the castle to defend it. The shattered door was blocked with debris and cards. Devils began to pour in. The militia fought valiantly but quickly were overrun. The peasants and guardsmen, with simple swords and chain, were no match for gibbering fiends from the lower realm. Noble demands they go with him to follow him into the high tower. On the way there, a flying devil grabs the noble's beautiful daughter. She screams as she attempts to free herself from its grasp. The ranger and twins attempt to bring it down but all of their shots miss. The devil rips her throat out and tosses her lifeless corpse to the ground. The ranger screams in anger and grief as the paladin drags him onwards, with the ranger screaming curses on all devils as they go. Crying, the noble leads them onwards. They go to the top of the tower and inside it, the noble reveals a mirror linked to his cousin's house in the lands to the west. He reveals he could have escaped through it anytime and he chose not to. He tells them to go through, that he would smash it upon their living and maybe they can rally enough people to have a fighting chance. Paladin tells him what he is doing is suicide. Noble gives him a haunted look and says his people will soon be dead and his daughter just died before his eyes. He has nothing left to live for. He draws his sword as party mutely walks through the mirror. The last they see of the noble is him standing with his blade out as crawling demons come up to the stairs. Then the mirror tumbles to the earth and goes blank becoming sheer grey glass with no reflection. In the kingdom to the west, they exit into the throne room, which is bustling with activity. All diviners and clerics got messages all at once that the end was nigh. The party gets everyone's attention and explains what happened. 
Human Ranger is inconsolable as he describes the fate of his lover. Nobles everywhere are aghast at what the Society of the Black Sun has done, realizing their mistakes. This is not a sentence for them, but for the devils they prayed to for miracles. The king asks for ideas. They don't know how to stop the devils pouring through, even if they could drive them back. Clary Girl pipes up and suggests that they build a trap around the portal, maybe trapping the devils from coming through. Twins extrapolate on this further, thinking they could expand the trap to kill any devils that attempt to come through. King approves this idea and a great undertaking is launched. Every kingdom in the world, great and small, send their armies to contain the portal. Everyone who can put hammer to rock is conscripted to make bricks. Clerics bless the bricks without end with the prayers of their gods. No one in the world is spared the undertaking. Everyone is conscripted or killed for non-compliance, for the very world is at stake. The party is hip deep in preparations. The ranger fights on the front lines like a man possessed. The paladin balances his time between fighting and curing what injured he can. The cleric runs herself ragged running field hospitals and smiting the occasional devil. Tens of thousands are lost. The twins each lose an arm to a giant devil that beat them as they defended camps from flying devils that attacked in the night. The devils are pushed back to the black sun portal but not without horrifying losses. The first walls are erected with soldiers standing guard and killing any devils that exit the portal. The paladin stands at the front alongside the ranger as the consecrated walls begin to enclose the portal. Traps and enchantments are set by every mage, rogue, engineer and wise man in the kingdom. Traps of ice, fire, poison and every other kind of imaginable begin to decorate the wall prison around the portal. The walls begin to get larger and more complex. Every tree and rock in the area is not spared in the construction of the vast cage that will save the world. Years pass as the construction continues, with fewer and fewer devils making it out each year. Soon, a greater lord from the Nine Hells attempts to breach through. The lesser consecration seems to have no effect on him. The cleric, now older and wiser, leads her entire faith in prayer. They beseech Lyra to stop the devils. Using the cleric as a conduit, Lyra makes the entire labyrinth glow like a star. The walls begin to glow with holy light as lesser devils are vaporized outright. The devil, shrieking, flees back into the portal as the labyrinth now causes him insane panic to set foot into. The cleric, now utterly spent beyond all measure, dies quietly after thanking her goddess for one final miracle. The labyrinth is now secure. Its many walls blanket the countryside the size of a massive city. It's completely enclosed, a maze that is self-repairing, consecrated and filled with traps. The work of an entire world. The land around the labyrinth is now desolate. The world beyond isn't much better. With every resource dedicated to stopping the devil's invasions, very little farming or gathering was done. Famine soon sets in and many die. No one blames what's left of the party, but they know it's their fault. They didn't stop the ritual when they had the chance. The ranger goes into the labyrinth saying he's going to dedicate the rest of his life killing the devils that stole his love on their own land. The paladin takes over the old noble's land and actually manages to find his skeleton in the high tower, mangled but surrounded by the bones of many devils. He buries him properly and rules his desolate lands as best as he can, making himself the self-proclaimed watchman of the labyrinth's entrance. The twins, now each with prosthetic arms, open their own academy dedicated to the destruction magics. They have an entire branch of learning dedicated to the killing of fiends. The cleric is immortalized as a saint who saved the world after failing it once. Orphanages and churches are opened in her name and a statue is erected outside the labyrinth in her honor. Eventually, the world recovered. Its people repopulated over the eons. Forests and crops grew back and soon the events turned into a legend of heroes that failed to heed a prophecy which almost ended the world. Soon, even the legends of old began to fade from the world, as only a pair of the oldest elves, each with prosthetic arms, remember the true events of what really happened. But at the center of the continent, there lies a massive stone labyrinth, bigger than the biggest cities. They say monsters litter the inside, milling about in a search for an escape to the outside world. A statue of an unknown woman stands outside, with a beatific smile on her face. They say if you get to the center, there's a treasure there. Some kind of gem called the Black Sun. If you can find it, all the riches of the world will be yours. So what are you waiting for? The Black Sun is waiting for you. <laughs> oh wow, Jesus Christ, that was actually absolutely f***ing amazing, dude. Jesus Christ, that was great. That was a beautiful story. That was 
That was beautifully written and constructed. Come on. All right. On that note, that's me for today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to leave a like if you did and subscribe for more if you haven't already. Also, thank you to everyone supporting the channel on Patreon as well as on YouTube. I appreciate a lot. Thanks so much for those. Links below. You can check them out as well as links to the social media, Discord, Sabbath, everything else. And yeah, that's it. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.